The whole denominational system box the church as it is on the New Testament. It makes light of the essentiality of the church because denominationalism cannot exist and the church of our Lord be what the Bible says it is. If everybody believed in the one church like they claimed to believe in the one Lord and the one God, denominationalism would be destroyed. Yet when we open up our Bibles, we find that the church is mentioned in all sorts of ways from the Old and throughout the New Testament. So I would like for a little while do a series on the church as seen by the prophets. You remember also that in the premillennial era, they don't believe the church and the kingdom are one and the same institution. They actually think that Christ came to set up His kingdom, but that when the Jews didn't receive Him as the Messiah, He set up the church as sort of an afterthought. And that when He comes yet in our future, He will set up the kingdom. Well, there's a whole lot of things wrong with that, which we don't intend to go into right now. But one of the things that comes out very clearly in the study of the whole Bible regarding the church is the church was a very prepared for institution that long before it was established on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in Jerusalem, as Luke records in Acts chapter 2, it was being talked about by the prophets. We're familiar with Romans 15 and 4 where Paul writing the church at Rome said of the Old Testament things that whatsoever was written aforetime was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, and the Scriptures there would be the Old Testament Scriptures. Well, there's much in them about a lot of things concerning Christianity, but one of those things is the church. In John chapter 5 and verse 39, Jesus said to the Jews, and He would be talking about the Old Testament Scriptures here, Ye search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. The only scriptures the people of Jesus' day had were the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus said they testify of him, for the prophets prophesied of the Christ. But they not only prophesied of the Christ, but they also prophesied of his spiritual body, the church. In Luke 24 and verse 44, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things might be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now I pause here with those three verses to refer back even to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, which is the first promise of the seed of woman inflicting a mortal wound to the head of the serpent, which of course we know from all of the scriptures put together pertaining to that, that that was Christ dying on the cross. Thus, when he rose from the dead to die no more, he inflicted a grave wound to Satan and the power Satan has on us by getting us to sin because the way of the forgiveness of sins has been made possible by the gospel of Jesus Christ and our belief and obedience to it. That's why Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the answer to overcoming Satan, Romans 1 verse 16. When you come down later to the time of Noah, 
Even the ark is a type of the church. And when you come to Abraham as a scheme of redemption is being developed, as we studied this morning in Genesis chapter 12, God made it clear to Abraham that through his seed, all nations, that seed is singular, and that's the way Paul, arguing for uh, the fact that the Gentiles had a right to the gospel as well as the Jews, they didn't need to be circumcised as uh, they did as proselytes under the law, that the seed singular was what brought salvation because that seed would be Christ according to the flesh. So uh, according to the flesh, Christ came into the world as a descendant of Abraham and via the tribe of Judah and the family of David. All those prophecies were fulfilled. All of them didn't just rest in the person of the Christ, but what Christ would do. And the prophets examined those things also. So although the Lord's church was established, as we read of it in Acts 2, the New Testament reveals it. The Old Testament prophets saw and described the church. They did that in symbols and in figures of speech or in language that were within the bounds of the normal day usages of language and experiences and culture and society of their time. You've heard me say recently quite a bit in different classes that you try to get your mind back to the language of the day and how those people viewed things. You cannot take our modern mind back to their time and view it in that way. You have to understand the culture, society, language, technology, and so forth, and how their words were used. Now, I think a good example of that is about as simple as it can be. If those of us who are old enough to have been around 40 years ago, most of us would not have really known much about a mouse. I remember, because uh, that, that kind of changes uh, definition of the years, doesn't it? It still holds the old definition of a little animal as vermin, but it also now talks about what you move the cursor around. As Brother Deaver was trying to explain to Sister Deaver, and he says, this is the cursor. And she said, oh, it has one of those too. <laughs> well, it's probably made a lot of people who <laughs> weren't too concerned about right and wrong exercise that, which they shouldn't. But nevertheless, words change. They change in meaning. New words are added. Old ones are dropped and so forth. So we need to know that when we're studying the Bible. Man in every age had been dependent on figurative language. Inspiration enabled biblical writers to draw upon the things that the people of their time were familiar with in their day, their business, and all that, but they did it to reveal spiritual things so the people on their own level of understanding could grasp it. You know, this is the same, and maybe we see it this way too, except for the beauties of nature and things of great value in this life, a person would be very limited in his concept of the beauty and glory of heaven. Think about how God says, now here's something you understand. Let me tell you about heaven in the light of what you understand. You think there are literally streets of gold? Do you think there's literally pearly gates? All material things have been burned up. That's figurative language, things we hold in high value and beauty here to try to say to us where we are now. Here is how beautiful it is. So we sing that song, How Beautiful Heaven Is must be. Jesus taught spiritual truths by means of parables. And uh, parables have been defined as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, that's rather simple, but I think it does the job quite well. It's sort of like the definition of faith, taking God at His Word. Our Lord used parables that utilize the simple and common affairs and activities of life in order to teach and make his disciples 
if they wanted to, of course, understand the spiritual aspects of His church, His kingdom, His spiritual body, the spiritual temple, and so on. With respect to the problem of communicating to these mouthpieces of God, these prophets, the spiritual concepts, and even the predictive element of prophecy have to do with future events, then God often revealed to His prophets His message of the moment and of the future by means of these symbols and figures of speech. Let's remind ourselves, though I think most of us know it, that a word is nothing but a sign representing an idea in your mind. If I say water, what is that? What comes to your mind? So, if we communicate, then we have to have the same representative of the ideas so you know what I'm talking about. And I'll know what you're talking about. So in just listening to one another, there is interpretation going on in our minds of what we hear. Thus, to speak the same language is to use the same signs of ideas. And even then, at times, the more complicated things are, we may have to do some repeating and explaining and all of this. Because speech is wonderful as it is in some languages, far more vivid and capable of expressing details than others, we still sometimes have to go back over it to understand things better. And if anybody ever put together any kind of thing, like a swing set or anything like that, they wondered about whoever wrote those directions in the first place is their ability to communicate anything. Uh, but anyway, that shows you a simple illustration of communication and of understanding that was intended to take place in the mind of those who received the communication. But it's going to either be by written down signs of ideas or spoken signs of ideas. So they are vehicles of thought. Our ideas travel to us through language. And so the prophets spoke of the church and the Christ and many other things by language. Thus they had the language of their day that was fitted into their culture. If you ever try to study a language or understand much about how language, besides English of course, communicates, in other words, you're in among a bunch of people who don't speak English, and you do, and you can't speak their language. You'll see how much that language begins to be developed within the culture and society. That's why many times it's easier to learn what we would call a foreign language when you're in the midst of the culture and society where it's spoken, because that language has been influenced by that culture and society. So with respect to the problem of communicating to the prophets spiritual concepts and future events, God often revealed His prophets His messages of the moment and of the future by signs of ideas, vehicles of thought. And some of them were figurative based upon how the people of that time used them. The prophets therefore in turn spoke in terms of these symbols and figures of speech in order to inform their audiences of the very nature and blessings that would be characteristic in our study now of the Lord's church. And in so doing, they wrote or they spoke in terms of their past and present historical experience. By the way of example of what I just said, to the Jews, the term Egypt always conveyed the Israelites to the Israelites the concept of bondage. That was always the thought in the mind of the Israelites. Egypt would be used then in their vernacular to indicate bondage. It still is us to us today. When we talk about being lost in our alien sins, we're talking about sins that separated you from God before you ever became a Christian. 
then when you look at the Old Testament, you see that Israel in bondage down in Egypt represents man lost in sin. Thus, in order to leave Egypt, God had to lead them and guide them and direct them. And how did he do it? Did it through Moses. But he's a type of the Christ. And then Paul even tells us they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Thus, they were freed from that bondage. But then we have lessons pertaining to living the Christian life because the Israelites traveling in the wilderness are called the church in the wilderness. They're fleshly Israel. We're spiritual Israel. Yet those things were written to teach spiritual Israel how we should respond to the authority of God and not do the things they did. All of it had to do with the church, you see. Then as you go further, you, you find that Paul will say, uh, God was not well pleased with them. And then he mentioned how that they died. And lo and behold, at the end of all that, he says that we should be careful lest the one that thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. And he said in that context. Yet all of that pertains to something that helps us today in the church itself that was established in Acts chapter 2. So when you begin to look at the Old Testament regarding the church, there is so much of it that touches upon not just the person of Christ, but the church he purchased with his own blood, and to which he adds all those who hear, believe, and obey the gospel of Christ and being baptized in the Christ. Well, what about the term Babylon? Guess what it conveyed? Captivity. The people went away into captivity because they would not be faithful to God. And they stayed 70 years in that captivity. The term Canaan conveyed the concept of a delightful land. And it uses, uses term, the land flowing with milk and honey. You know, we, if we don't watch out, we'll think, that's the, the Israelites are the only ones that ever had that concept. But if you read ancient literature, you'll find when they described any kind of fertile, marvelous place, that's the way they described it. Land flowing with milk and honey. And that's what Canaan was to Israel. Because remember, they, they have been developed into a nation from no people, God says, into a people. And it's by God's high hand that they're led out of Egypt. And he brings them down to Mount Sinai. And there's the people now they have a law. And then, you might say after a 40-year weeding out process, they now have a land. And that's how you define a country or a nation. is a people, a land, and a law. And that's what they have. Yet that was fleshly Israel. God never intended it to be forever. It was limited just to the Jewish people. Because fundamentally, it was there to bring Christ into the world through the flesh. Galatians 4 and verse 4, In the fullness of time God sent forth His Son. So Canaan was a place of blessedness. And we, we sing about that sometimes, don't we? On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast the wishful eye. To Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We shall rest in the fair and happy land. Well, that's tearing that old concept Starting all the way back there to the Jewish mind, thinking about a land that belongs to us, that God gave us. Well, even Pat Boone got that right. He just linked it up to the wrong bunch in the Exodus song, which he wrote. He said, this land is mine. God gave this land to me. Well, that's true in the Old Testament situation, but not true of modern Israel. For they fulfilled all God ever intended them to do. And they didn't do that as a nation whole. Only some did it. God himself was pleased to, and I guess this is a good way to put it, because he knew how he made man and thus knew how he made man to understand anything. So you can say God did condescend to man's necessity by ascribing himself deity as having hands and feet and eyes and ears, thereby denoting that he has the power to execute all such acts as are capable or man is capable of doing and far, far more than that. <clears throat> but I can understand that. 
the hand of God is upon you. We still might use that one sometimes. There are many of those times. The eye of God. The all-seeing eye. There's an eye watching you. This kind of thing. Well, he doesn't have any physical thing about him. But I understand that. God has talked to us the way we can understand things. And he knows we have never lived in a world of the Spirit. We live in a material world, a material body with physical appetites governed by time. But he wants us to know about him. So he gets down to our level and talks to us. Sometimes you hear people talk about the Bible as if it's a book. that Well, we could never understand that thing. Well, why do we have it in the first place? Why did God give it to us? To confuse us? No, He gave it to us to enlighten us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now, looking at the Old Testament prophets, we learned that there were two classifications of prophets. There were the oral prophets of which you read about. And there were the writing prophets. Now when you list the names of the prophets of the Old Testament, then you're of course talking about the writing prophets. But you'll find out there's prophets like Nathan. That's an oral prophet. You don't find anything Nathan ever wrote. But you'll find those various prophets were oral prophets, and they were just as much prophets as the writing prophets. Now you say, well, why did God do it that way? Why do people raise those questions? Uh, it's like people saying, well, why did God make me? Well, if he explains it to you, you understand it. You're still here, and you still got to do what you got to do while you're here. Some things are not worth wasting our mind to think about. The Bible even enlightens us, though, on where did I come from, why am I here, where I'm going. Somebody said one time, couldn't God have populated heaven with people and done it in a complete different way? Well, no doubt he could, but he did it this way. Sort of like saying, well, I believe God saved me of my sins if he tells me to take a double-bit axe and cut down a sweet gum tree that's six inches through. I do that and I demonstrate my faith in Him. You know what somebody else be doing? Oh, I think He could save me some other way. I think He could save me if He buried me in water and raised me up to walk a, a new life. Somebody's going to try their best to do as they please and there's the problem. That old will of man. So whatever way God says anything, there's somebody, when God demands of us to do something, that's going to figure out something to say, well, I think you could have done it a different way. It really wouldn't make any difference whichever way he done it. Man got to do what he wants to do. And there's the problem. There were no writing prophets before, I don't know whether you ever noticed this or not, the period of what we know as the divided kingdom. You'll remember when Rehoboam came to the throne succeeding his father Solomon that he was a spoiled brat and acted like it. And so when the older men told him how to get along with folks and how things work out, he'd listen. He listened to the other smart elects of his same age. And thus he caused the kingdom to split. And Jeroboam led off those ten northern tribes and starting the northern kingdom of Israel. And then there was Judah, the little tribe of Benjamin left. And it was known as the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, of the 14 prophets who wrote, eight of them wrote about the church and wrote about the church by means of symbols and figures of speech. The eight prophets who wrote about the church were Joel, Amos, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah. I'm not going to try to cover all those today. In fact, this is coming from what turned into three chapters in Michael's book this year. And uh, so I'm going to just cover, that's the introduction right there, cover a little bit of it. Amos was one of the minor prophets. Why minor? Well, their books were shorter. Major prophets, what does that mean? Isaiah and Jeremiah, long were books. The books were more lengthy. He was a prophet of the southern kingdom, that is Amos. That is Judah too, that's the southern kingdom. And if I, did I introduce this as Joel or did I say Amos? Amos. 
I said, which? Amos. I don't like Amos right now. I'm going to go back to Joel. <laughs> Amos, um, we'll get to a little later. He was a keeper of sycamine trees. Now there's your assignment. Before we get to Amos, go find out what a sycamine tree, because your King James Version says sycamore. And I assure you, it's not the sycamore we're familiar with. So see what you can find about that. No, no fair looking it up now. So, Joel, he was uh, of the southern kingdom also. And his name means Jehovah, or is being used more and more, Yahweh is God. Let me give you this little treatise on Jehovah. You'll find Jehovah used in the King James, most of the American standard. Jehovah is an invented English word. Um... I cannot remember the exact year, but Jehovah was an invented English word that came to be used sometime in the 1400s, 1500s, somewhere back then. Didn't use it before then. The Jews had what was called the Tetragrammaton. And they would not pronounce what we know as Yahweh. They wouldn't put the vowels in it, so we don't know how it was pronounced. So even when we come up with Yahweh, we've had to add the vowels to get Yahweh. But it's closest to what we tend to use over the years as Jehovah. So I won't even charge extra anybody for that. But they just came to mind going through here. He prophesied in uh, 800, you know, you get like this when you got down to dates back in this time, about 835 B.C., and that's in the ninth century. That's when he did his work. We're talking about the old works will have B.C. before Christ. Uh, the new works will have B.C.E. before the common era. We think, and that's about all we can say about that, that he was a contemporary of Elisha and in Israel, Elisha followed, you know, Elijah. So he was working about that time. Elisha, of course, was not a writing prophet. And yet we have a lot written about him and his great faith. But we don't have him writing anything in particular. And many believe Joel to be the earliest of the writing prophets. We just don't know that much. We're just saying what people think. And they have reasons for thinking it. But this is one of those cases, sort of like dates. Rarely are you right on the button. When you talk about 3,000 years ago, you know, if you get within 50 years, you're off close, or 100 or 200 years. So you've got to keep that in mind. Uh, some think that Obadiah was the one that uh, was the earliest writing prophet. But now, this is where this gets important with Joel. When Peter stands up to preach on the day the church started, and they had been accused of being drunk. Peter said they hadn't had time to be drunk. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, you know, a person that's drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning, more than likely he's drunk 24 hours a day. But anyway, that's what Peter said. And then in answering what was going on, he quotes Joel 2, verse 28. It's in that context that Peter begins his sermon. And that's important to understand. Because what had transpired before Peter stood up with the eleven? Well, you had that sound of a rushing mighty wind, like a hurricane blowing, but there wasn't any wind. Just keep that in mind. You've all heard big winds. Well, there was a wind there, but I've never heard something that sounded like a wind, but everything just as still as it can be. And it comes from up to down, but there's no wind, but it sounds like a great wind. Then on each one of the Apostles, there's cloven tongues like as a fire. Not fire, but like as a fire. And they all began to speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if you're somebody witnessing all of that, uh, when I see people and, and you see a wreck on the interstate and hear a cross on the opposite lane going the other direction, it bottlenecks too. Now, what does that happen? People trying to rubberneck and look and see what is happening over there. I mean, you know, they may miss somebody's 
head cut off or something, and they got to see it. And that causes bigger problems. Or something like that. Well, God knows man. Thus, to attract man, he has something happen that men couldn't do. And they're all amazed. And some are mocking. You know, when you have things happen like this, you always got the some says coming out as to what's happening. So Peter says, these men aren't drunken, seeing as but the ninth hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, Peter is guided by the Holy Spirit. Now I'm about to see a divine commentary inspired of God as to the meaning of Joel 2.28. If I didn't know before, I'm going to know now because God's telling me. Anytime you have an inspired commentary, that's the right comment. And it is, and, you, and it shall come to pass the last days that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And he says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Now Peter says, this is what's happening. And who told him to say that? The Holy Spirit. Who inspired Joel to write what he did hundreds of years before? The same Holy Spirit. Now what's time to the Holy Spirit? Nothing. Joel saw the church as having its beginning with a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is called in the Scriptures the baptismal measure of power of the Holy Spirit. The concept of an outpouring or overwhelming of a storm was a rather common occurrence to both Joel and the people to whom he spoke. And we still have a view of that. If you just think about the recent flood of last August, I'd say there's a lot of, they'll always refer around here back to that flood as to the measure now, unless a bigger one comes, of what it is for things to flood around here because things flooded that never had flooded before. At least in our recollection. I can tell you one time it flooded. <laughs> it covered everything. <laughs> when Joel spoke of all flesh, the concept was that the Spirit would be poured out without distinction of race, Jew and Gentile. He doesn't mean that every single solitary walking fleshly body on this earth was that way. He also is indicating this is the beginning of this because miracles are going to continue on for quite a few years in the future. When he spoke of servants and handmaids, the concept of the Spirit being poured out was the idea of being poured out without distinction of social position. That's what these words conveyed. On the Memorial Day of Pentecost, then, they were baptized, the apostles were, with the Holy Spirit. Peter declared in Acts 2.16, but this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. So the Lord's church had been ushered in by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And in so doing, Joel's prophecy had begun to be fulfilled. Now, very quickly... These Jews are described as devout Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven. These are Jews that know their Old Testament. They knew this that Joel had written. That wasn't the first time they ever heard that. Did they understand to what it was pointing? No. But how are they going to say that Peter didn't know a thing in the world he's talking about? Because God had something to say in the matter to prove that Peter and the other apostles were not speaking of their own knowledge. So I want to bring that up, and then the next one we'll look at will be Amos. If you're not a Christian, know this, that when the Lord adds the obedient person to the church, there were thousands of years in Old Testament history that God was preparing the minds of the people for the Lord's church, and it's not just an accidental institution. When Jesus shed His blood to purchase the church, Acts 20 and 28, He knew what He was going to do before He ever tabernacled in the flesh. He knew exactly what He was going to bring into existence because He knew the whole situation as to how after these earthly things are all over, 
and all has been reduced to nothing by the fires at the end of time, they would stand out an institution to populate heaven and to do things that we don't even have any idea what God has in store for us, for those that love Him, to use a turn to the Scriptures. The church is precious indeed, and we should want to see it governed by the authority of Jesus Christ, for it's His. And we should know that when we have believed in Him, repented of our sins, and confessed our faith in Him, that we are baptized into Christ. That's the church. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And it's precious and it's important. And we're part of it. And we should do all we can to keep the church like Jesus in the New Testament says He wants it. In organization, in worship, in the individual lives that we have in the church. If you're a child of God, does that not point up more what God thinks about you, that He would add you to that which took thousands of years down through the stream of time to get ready for and bring into existence by the coming of His Son and what He did? If you've committed sin, we ask you to humbly repent and confess it and pray God for forgiveness as God's second law of pardon for His children. But if you need to obey the gospel, we ask you to come now while we stand and sing.